there are three main points I wanted to make about the lessons that Tisha B'Av brings to our day-to-day -day life in terms of dealing with ongoing stress and ongoing loss. And as I've been thinking about it, I'm thinking that in some ways, that to the extent that we're told that, that part of life is lamo benisionos, is the challenge of uh, meeting the difficult kind of stresses of life, in that sense, the lessons of Tisha B'Av and of the weeks leading up to Tisha B'Av are profoundly, profoundly important for us. The first point I wanted to make has to do with bringing memory from passive memory into active memory. Memory alone is dry. It's without a soul. It's like reading a history book. It doesn't mean very much. One of the lessons of Tisha B'Av is the need to integrate memory with the emotional, to make it literally an active part of us. I have a colleague, a very well-known expert in the field of trauma. His name is Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, world-renowned expert. He was a professor of psychiatry at Harvard, now at Boston University, and he's extremely passionate about trying to understand the impact of trauma on people's brains and on people's souls. And we were once working together on an article, on a paper, we had the privilege of doing some research with them. And one day he shows me, with tremendous excitement, the picture of the brain of one of his patients. It was an fMRI, a brain technique, that you could actually look into how active different parts of the brain are as the brain is experiencing different kinds of emotions. In this situation, it was a patient of his who was stuck in the stairwell of the World Trade Center on 9-11. And it was a picture of his brain at the exact moment that it was having a flashback to the worst moment of his life. It was literally, as I looked at it, it was looking at what does our brain experience? What do we experience as we're re-experiencing the worst moment of our lives? And it was an amazing thing to see. Because as you look at it, what you see is Broca's area is shut down. The language centers of the brain are shut down. Do you know what happens when you're flashing back to the worst moment of your life? You're literally rendered speechless. Then, what Dr. van der Kolk showed in subsequent work with this patient was that as he gave this patient of his words for his pain, as he helped him find meaning for his pain, as he lit up Broca's area, that's where the refua, where the cure came. In many ways, that's part of the lesson of Tisha B'Av. To bring it back to Pesach, Rabbi Harlap, the grandfather of the Rabbi Harlap at YU, brilliantly said in his Haggadah, the main Marom, he was a rabbi in Jerusalem in the early 1900s, and he says the following, he says, slavery takes away our koach hadibur, takes away our power of speech. When we're slaves, we're robbed of almost of the right to express our feelings, to express our thoughts to express our emotions. He said, when we sit around the Seder table, Seder night, the most universally observed holiday in the Jewish calendar, what we're doing is magid. It's our answer to slavery. We're lighting up Brokaw's area. We're lighting up the language centers of the brain and giving meaning to our suffering and answering the silence of slavery with the words of freedom surrounded by our family. That's partly the lesson of Tisha B'Av. We take the memory of our collective suffering as we look back on one of our greatest tragedies and we not only remember it, we actively join in sitting on the ground and in recalling what happened and then together as a people lighting up the language centers of the brain, integrating memory with the emotional and with the active.
It's an extremely important lesson for life. A study I wanted to share with you and then a vignette and then I'll move on to my, my next two points. The study was one of my favorite studies in the field of trauma and it very much makes this point. They looked at a group of children who were orphaned in the Yom Kippur War in the early 70s. These were boys and girls whose fathers were killed in the Yom Kippur War. And they followed them into adulthood to see what were the ingredients of resilience. Turns out, somewhat counterintuitively, when they grew up in homes where even if their mothers remarried, the memories of their father was actively kept alive, that even if they remarried, pictures of their father remained on the nightstands, remained on the mantle in the living room. If the mother continued to shed tears at the memory of her first husband and gave her sons and daughters permission to express his sadness in a way that integrated it into the new normal of their lives as they moved on past the tragedy of loss, those were the kids who were most resilient. Again, the lesson of Tisha B'Av. And I'll end it with a personal experience I had with one of my patients, with one of my clients. There was a young man, high school boy, who came to see me for a variety of reasons. He was having some problems with a chronic depression tied to the death of his grandfather. Now usually when somebody loses a grandparent, it's sad, but it's not so profoundly sad that it stops the person from functioning. In this boy's case, it did. He had totally shut down. He wasn't recovering. It was way past the point that you'd expect him to continue to be in profound grief. And as I saw him, I realized why. He had parents who were wonderful, loving parents, but had, both had very high-pressured careers and were hardly ever around. His grandfather was the one who was there for him all the way through his childhood. So when his grandfather died, it was like the loss of his mother and father rolled into one. And I was seeing him, and we were making some progress. I was certainly feeling like I was connecting to him, but I wasn't getting far enough. And I just was feeling kind of stuck in terms of the counseling sessions with him. One day, he comes practically bouncing into my office. He says, Doc, don't have to see you anymore. We're finished. And he was right. We were finished. I asked him, what happened? And he shows me his running shoes. I said, what, 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 what are you talking about? He said, I realize what was bothering most. He said, I'm a starter on my Yeshiva High School's basketball team. And the only member of my family that came to every home game and every away game was my grandfather. And I realized that that was sort of symbolic of the loss. And I missed that the most. He then takes off his running shoes and he shows me on the soul, written, L'zecher nishmas Chaim ben Avraham. In memory of Chaim, his grandfather's name, the son of Avraham, his great-grandfather's name. He said, I wrote this in permanent magic marker on the bottom of the soles of both of the shoes that I wear when I play basketball. Ever since then, I've been the high scorer in every game. I feel as I shoot a basket that I'm being carried by my grandfather's soul. He said, I think I'm fine, and he was. I stayed in touch with him even to this day a little bit. He's gone on to uh, do beautifully in life. But it was this bringing memory from the passive into the active, making it part of himself again, the lesson of Tisha B'Av is we light up the language centers of the brain in a way that we integrate it. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two. Lesson number two is a fascinating insight shared by Rav Yeruchim Levavitz, the Mashkiach and pre-Holocaust Mir, who was brilliant in terms of his psychological insights. And he makes the following really important point. He talks about a very cryptic passage in the Torah, in Mishpatim, where it talks about God's footstool. Here's what it says. It says, God's footstool was sapphire, and embedded in the sapphire was a brick. And we're told the brick was a reminder of our suffering and slavery in Egypt. 
very strange, whatever that means in terms of the divine. Very hard to understand. So, what Rabbi Rucham explains is the following. He asks the question, Ma inyan shibud la'achar ha'gu'ula? Why have a reminder of suffering after the redemption? Let it go. Let it all go. It makes no sense. Why have that reminder? And he says it's because of a very important psychological lesson that is implied by God's footstool. He says, in life, very often we go through hard times, then things get better. But we have to remember the lesson of the brick and integrate the lesson of the brick into the times of light. Even when things are wonderful, it may be tempting not to remember our past suffering. He says we have to remember it. Rabbi Lamb brilliantly points out that in a famous pasuk in Echa, Golsa Yehuda Meoni, there is a medrash that says the following. It says, Alechem Oni She Ochlu Chametz Bepesach. Very cryptic kind of medrash. But what it explains is, is we were doomed to repeat history because we didn't remember it. Our forefathers at the time of the destruction of the Beis Hamikdash didn't remember the lessons of our suffering in Egypt. And they ate bread on Pesach. And as a result, as it says in Echa, Golsa Yehuda Meoni. As a result, they were doomed to repeat that lesson. So that's lesson number two, is to always remember our past suffering, not in a morbid way, not in a way that we delve on the negative, but in a way that we delve into it to learn lessons for the future. We have to understand that the lessons of the brick have to be integrated into the light. And a final point. The final point is the point of connection. To a certain extent, Tisha B'Av can't really be properly celebrated alone. We sit on the floor together. We, we say kinnis together. We remember together as a community. That's part of the essence of Tisha B'Av. And I just wanted to end with a few points. Point number one is there's been a lot of research lately on finding what is the essence of resilience. In the field of positive psychology, some people ask, if you had only one question to ask to predict resilience, what's the question you would ask? Turns out there's one question that captures almost everything. Do you have one person in your life who you could wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and tell them that you're really worried about something. If you have just one person like that, it predicts resilience more than almost anything else. I came across that study that night. I woke my poor wife up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I said, wake up, wake up. She, says, she gets up, she says, is there anything? What, what is it? She says, I, this thing I have to talk to you about, I told her. And she gets up, she says, sure, tell me. I said, okay, go back to sleep. That's all I wanted to know. I mean, uh, it was... Um, just good to know that she's there if I need her, and we all need to cultivate that. But the bottom line of this, and with this I'll end, is the idea that we need to deal with the losses in our life together. There's a study that I've been quoting a lot lately. They take somebody to the bottom of a hill. They say, estimate the steepness of the hill. If you're alone, the hill looks very steep. If you're together with somebody at your side, the hill looks less steep. The closer you are to the person at your side, the less steep the hill looks and the less tired you get walking up the hill. Final story, and with this I'll conclude this, uh, these remarks. I often ask people, when I get together with them, Let's say they're going through some kind of tough time in life, and I go to different parts of the world. And I was talking to a Holocaust survivor who was sharing with me a lot about his experiences, an elderly man. And I asked him, I said, you know, our rabbis tell us, ma'at min ha'or doche harbe min little sparks of light push away a great deal of darkness. I said, what was the spark of light that got you through those horrible years in the camp? And he looked kind of wistfully at me, and with tears in his eyes, he answered, you know something? He said, 
My father used to bench me every Friday night. He used to bless me every Friday night. He'd put his hand on my head. He'd kind of cuddle into me. And he would bless me in a way that made me feel enveloped and protected. He said at the worst moments of my suffering in the concentration camp, I felt the warmth of the breath of my father. And I felt his hands as if they were continuing to be on my head. And that's what got me through. That was my source of light. So these three ingredients are the ingredients that I find are essential and woven into the lessons of Tisha B'Av. The ingredient of bringing memory from a sterile, passive process into an active one where we integrate the emotional with the cognitive, the idea that we have to embed the lesson of the brick and of suffering into the light even when life gets better, and finally, the power of connection as we stand together at the bottom of a hill together in facing life's adversities. Thank you.